getting ready for Easter and um, really the foundation of our faith that Jesus is not upon that cross anymore. He is risen from the dead and we proclaim that our Redeemer liveth. I think as we study Tabitha tonight or Dorcas, as actually she has two names, isn't that uh, it's an amazing thing in itself that this woman has actually two names, but uh, this one could really proclaim that her Redeemer liveth. You can imagine what it would be like to be a woman who was raised from the dead. Now, we know what it's like spiritually to be raised from the dead because we were once dead in our trespasses and our sins. And through the blood of Christ and the Spirit of God, he has quickened these mortal bodies, and now we live in newness of life. But to have actually died and then be resurrected from the dead to continue a ministry must have been an awesome, awesome experience. So let's turn tonight to Acts chapter 9. I love the book of Acts. Anytime we have anything to do with the book of Acts, it just stirs within me that deutimous power, that we cannot live this Christian life apart from the deutimous power, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost, when the church was born, Jesus left it, but he sent us a comforter, one that would come alongside, strengthen, and enable us to do the work, carry on the work, that Jesus uh, began when he was on the face of this earth. And so we walk in newness of life, in that power of the resurrection. And so let's look at her story in just a couple verses here. Uh, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 36. And we'll call her the study on Dorcas, also known as Tabitha, or it could be the reverse, Tabitha, also known as Dorcas. In verse 36, it starts out and it says, Now there was at Joppa... A certain disciple named Tabitha, and make a note here that this is the only woman that is actually called a disciple. And a disciple we know is one that's a devout follower of the Lord. And so her, she was significant enough for the Spirit of God to write in this account that she is uh, described here as a disciple. A certain disciple named Tabitha, this is her Hebrew name, by, uh, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Dorcas is her Greek name. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds which she did. And so there was just goodness pouring out of this woman. Alms deeds not only in deeds of kindness or acts of love, but also financially. There was some uh, monies involved in the alms deeds, or alms or uh, offerings or financial help in some way. So it involved both material things and it involved money that uh, she was responsible for and which she was in, uh, able to help the poor and the needy. Verse 37 says, says, And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Now, we don't know what she was sick, why she was sick or what she was sick of, but obviously it was fatal, and she died. Whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber, for a, and for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, this is another city, maybe about 10 miles from Joppa, it was all uh, just a very short distance, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, and they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, he put them out, and he kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, I love that, because she had given her hand. And in her time of need, there was one to give her a hand. I just, I love that. And lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa. I can imagine that this uh, news went quite quickly. And many believed in the Lord. I would say so. And it came to pass that he tarried, this is Peter, uh, many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now, this many days ends up to be quite some time. This was such an open door of, of opportunity for Peter. There were so many new believers, so many converts to the faith, that he stayed behind to establish and teach them. And God opened some wonderful doors. So let's ask God's anointing upon his word tonight. Father, our hearts are stirred up already to study one who was raised from the dead. What an awesome miracle 
Again, we see and we are reminded that you are the God of the impossible, and we see you working in the lives of your people. Father, we just ask that you, by your Spirit, would remind each one of us that you are still the God of the impossible. And as we lay our impossible situations and troubles before you tonight, would you fill us with the confidence that you, the God of the impossible, is at work. We may not see it, it might not be obvious, but by faith we believe it. So, Father, would you ignite our hearts tonight? Would you, by your Spirit, illuminate your word, and may it pierce our hearts, and may, there bring, may it bring forth, as your word is planted deep within us, may the seed of your word bring forth much fruit in our lives. Enough fruit, Lord, to, f- to feed a multitude. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's daughters said, Amen. Dorcas was uh, alive at the time that Jesus walked the face of the earth. The church at this time is in its infant stage. It's approximately six years old. Dorcas is what they call a Hellenistic Jew. And what that meant is, is that she was raised in the Greek culture and spoke the language. And so that's why she has two names. It's interesting to note that Peter calls her by her Hebrew name, Tabitha. But the church calls her Dorcas, her Greek name. And uh, so there's the reason for um, the two names. Both of those names mean exactly the same thing, though, in, in, in interpretation. She's not a poor woman. She owns a two-story home. It was customary that when one died, they would uh, wash the body. And she had an upper room in which they laid her. And so that, that's what the scriptures say. They laid her in the upper room, indicating that she had a two-story home. It wasn't that she was extremely wealthy, but she did have means, and she had resources of some type. And yet her ministry is to the poor, to the needy, to those that are hurting, to the lonely, to those that have been abandoned or maybe neglected or need love. Do you know people like that? Do you know people that are hurting? Do you know people that are in a place of abandonment? maybe from their family, maybe from their friends, maybe they've been transplanted from another state or something or even another country, and they're feeling quite lost, maybe needy in a sense. Do you know people like that? Wow, what a ministry. You know, whenever we minister to the, the poor and needy or the hurting, we will, we will, when we have them in mind, we will always have someone to minister to. This is a powerful, powerful ministry that Dorcas realized the need and she realized the, the, um, the potential in ministering to people like this. Dorcas being raised from the dead was God's stamp of approval upon her life and her ministry. It wasn't Peter that raised Dorcas from the dead. God raised Dorcas from the dead. And I thought to myself, I've read a lot of stuff on this, and and one um, question came up that was, was the fact that, do you think that Dorcas regretted the fact that, you know, she dies and goes to heaven and they're praying her back? that she would have regrets of, you know, I mean, how many calluses do you think that she probably had on her fingers of sewing all these garments? I mean, this was tedious work. This was hard work. And to think that, you know, would she have had any regrets? But the type of woman that Dorcas was, there would be no, no regrets because this was the master's plan, that she would come and continue the work that he had, um, showed her to do. And so that's God's approval. And that's so important for us that when, as we serve the Lord, as we live our lives before him, so often we want man's approval and that's okay if it comes. But what is far more important is God's approval. That peace that passes understanding that we are a child of God, a daughter of God that is right where we're supposed to be doing just what we're supposed to be doing. We are, we are fulfilling God's will in our lives and we have God's stamp of approval. In that, it brings courage and strength and just a vision and passion. And anybody that comes into our path, anybody that comes into our lives or walks across our path, we have a confidence that God has sent that person. And there's one reason why God would send that person, and that would would be for them to be strengthened in the faith or come to know the Lord. God's stamp of approval upon her life. At this time, remember now, only Jews were saved. No Gentiles had entered the, the Christian church at this time. Church is in its infancy. There's no, no Gentile until the next chapter, in chapter 10, when Cornelius comes to Joppa and 
searches out. Well, actually, he sends somebody for Peter to tell him about the good news. He's searching. He's searching for life. And so Cornelius um, becomes really the first Gentile. And so we see that Dorcas dies in order to bring about revival. Obviously, there was a tremendous revival happened. Many believed in the city of Joppa. But not only that, she ushers in a new era of the church. She ushers in the time of the Gentiles. And so this, her life ends just Jews being saved and opens up this awesome opportunity, door of opportunity, and the Gentiles are ushered in to Christianity, ushered in to having a personal relationship with the Lord and being called a child of God. Now we, too, can be adopted, engrafted into the vine and nourished through the Spirit as we become um, born again, as we become children of God. When we die to self, it's, it's, this is, I think, the biggest lesson that we can see from Dorcas. When we die to self, every time when more of ourself dies, a portion of ourselves dies, we experience a personal revival. Something happens within us. And when it is the work of God, we become radically changed. A, a bad attitude becomes a good attitude. These are things that we can't do upon ourselves or, or apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And when we submit to that call of God, when he says, deny yourself, pick up your cross every day and follow him, more of me dies, more of the old woman dies, the old self, that just that self nature, that sin nature, that, that rebellion, that stiff neckness, that, that begins to die, that we begin to shed that old man and we begin to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, more and more and more. Then what happens within us is that we are revived inside. And we have more faith, and we have more trust in God, and we do believe in miracles because God is doing something inside of us. He's transforming us. He's becoming more real to us. And the result of that is that many will be influenced for for the Lord, for the kingdom of God. They're going to look at you and say, what has gotten into you? And you're going to say, Jesus, <laughs> more of Jesus. And that's, that's really the heart's cry is, is uh, less of me and more of him. Her place of residence. It's always interesting when we study the people in the Bible of their place of res- residence. It's, it's got a significance to it. It tells us here in verse 36 that she was in the city of Joppa. Now, Joppa is the oldest city. Um, in Israel, one of the oldest city, cities in Israel, dating all the way back to the flood. It's a beautiful seaport city along the Mediterranean Sea. It's about maybe 40 miles from Jerusalem. Today it still exists, and it's called Jaffa, or not too far from Tel Aviv. And this is the city that brought commerce to Ju- Jerusalem. It's what connected Jerusalem to the Western world. And in this seaport, the uh, cedars of Lebanon came in to build the temple. And so this was the main seaport, the harbor, where all of the goods from the, from the uh, Western world would come in and um, made Jerusalem uh, you know, wealthy and, and connected it to the world. However, this city also abounded in widows and orphans. For you see many that would take on the um, occupation of voyaging the sea. The sea was violent and took many lives. And so the consequences of many of these women is that they lost their husbands at sea. And with the husbands that died, um, many of them lost their income. And the world was not too kind to widows, and a lot of them ended up being beggars. And a lot of children were orphans. And so we see that the city was filled with opportunity to minister. The church at uh, Joppa was growing, it was on fire, it was flourishing. Remember the day of Pentecost, Peter got up, he uh, uh, preached a sermon, thousands came to the Lord. They in turn went back to um, their cities and they began fellowships. And so there was obviously a on fire, flourishing church here in Joppa. However, it isn't the church that made Joppa famous like Ephesus or Thyatira or Pergamos. No, it's Dorcas. Joppa is famous because of Dorcas being raised from the dead and her deeds of of kindness and her ministry. This woman gets saved. Somebody comes back, shares the gospel. She gets saved. She becomes a pillar in the church. And her ministry is so important, they can't do without her. And I thought about our place of residence, where we live. 
our place of um, where we abide, where we call home. Do we see that as a place that God has put us? God has put us there. This was the hand of God. And as in Dorcas's day, the time that she was born, what she was born, the culture that she was raised in, the language that she spoke, the city that she lived in, it was the hand of God upon her life. Do we see that today as well? Do we see that our place of residence is the place that God has put us? And no matter where that just happens to be, your place of residence, whatever you call home, whatever your address is, our task in that place is to be an influence for God, to influence God in that place. It's our Jerusalem. That's where God begins the work. And we have to be reminded every so often, how are you doing in your Jerusalem? Have you blown it lately? Have you had an attitude? Have you had an anger problem? Have you been frustrated with those that you live with? How are you doing in your Jerusalem? What a good, you know, check in, the, in our hearts tonight to remind us that ministry, the pow- most powerful ministry, is right within our own homes. How are we living? That's where we're free to be who we really are. Here at church, we put on a good, you know, our best behavior, I would hope. We come dressed up. We get maybe a new outfit to come to class, you know. We, we really put on our best, our best put forward when we come to church and fellowship and we're into the groups and ministering one to another. But at home, we kind of let our hair down. How are we doing in our Jerusalem? Just a question. That the Spirit of God would rule there too. And the greatest change is there within my own home, that those that are closest to me, can see a radical change, not just a little teeny change. I'm talking radical. I'm talking holiness unto the Lord. I'm talking deeds of kindness, words of kindness, actions. My whole appearance becomes different. My ambitions are different. The way I talk is different. But it's sincere. It's honest. Because it's a work that God is doing inside of me. And when that is seen in home, at home, That's a powerful, powerful testimony. That's where we're to be a witness first. That's how the book of Acts begins, that we would be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, starting with our Jerusalem. Also, this city, remember, it is famous also or known as the place that um, Jonah tried to run from God. God says, go to Nineveh, but Jonah goes to Joppa to catch a uh, a bus. A boat, (laughs) bus, boat, whatever, (laughs) plane, what are you catching, you know, (laughs) to go to Tarsus. Are you running from something? Are you running from the work that God wants to accomplish in your life? Joppa also represents, oh, daughters of God, sit still. Sit before the Lord. Find out what he's doing within your life. There's that uneasiness that, you know, that's the first thing, the first inclination when things go wrong. I want to just run. I just want to get out of here. I just want to go away. I want them to go away. And we have this tendency to run. But that's where we need to sit. Don't, don't go to Tarsus when God is saying, go to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh, those people are just, they don't, they're not even worth talking to. They're not, they're not worthy to be known. They're not worthy of Christianity. They're not worthy to know you, Lord. That's what Jonah said. And then when Jonah finally got swallowed up by the fish and all oh, those horrible trials that he went to, he comes back and he says, okay, God, I'm ready to do what you want me to do. What would you like me to do? And God says, go to Nineveh. Stop running. How about her beautiful characteristics? The first thing I see is that she reflects Jesus. Jesus shines through this woman. Notice that it says that her name is Tabitha, Tabitha by interpretation, Dorcas. Now, the word by interpretation means to unfold the meaning. And so Tabitha is her Hebrew name, being Jewish, and Dorcas is her Greek name because she was raised in the Greek culture. Both of them um, mean the exact same thing, and this speaks of her inner beauty. The name means, Dorcas and Tabitha, both mean gazelle. Now, gazelle is a small, deer-like animal, very beautiful. It has distinct markings. It is a very graceful little deer. It can run. Um, You know, you think of hind's feet in high places. The thing that's significant about this little gazelle is it has big brown eyes. I mean, that's just very, very significant upon this animal. And we think of her inner beauty, that she is like a gazelle. And remember, the psalmist says that as a deer pants after water, so I after you, O Lord. Is that the desire of your heart? Is that what's going on deep within you? Is that you are as a deer that's running through the forest, maybe trying to get away from someone that is pursuing it, and it's just out, it's out of breath, and it's just thirsty as a deer pants for the water. Do we pant 
for God? Does our soul desire to be only satisfied by him, that we hunger and thirst after righteousness? That inner beauty, it speaks of the grace and the beauty of the Lord seen in her. This is something that others can see. It isn't just something that I have to tell everybody that I am a Christian. I am living the Christian life. That's what the disciple, um, the call of a disciple is. I don't have to say what I am. I don't have to say that I'm a Jesus freak or I love the Lord or I love Jesus or I, that's who I stand for. No, he's on my lips. He's in my heart. He's shining through us. And that, that's because there's a longing deep within to get closer and closer to the Lord. It's, it's a, a one that is benevolent and caring. The fruits of the Spirit are operating within our lives. We're getting better at this kindness thing. We're getting better at unconditional love, loving these people with no conditions. That's a kind of a lifetime lesson. But every time we have an opportunity, we get better and better at agabying people, loving them without any strings attached, just loving them because that's the command of my master. A disciple is like a bond slave. It speaks of the caring. I think of the eyes, the large eyes on this little deer. She had large eyes of love and compassion to see more than just a need. She saw these people hurting, that they were in need. She reached out to the poor and needy. She saw that they needed something, but it was more than just recognizing a need. She received a solution that, Lord, how can I help? If you're going to show me the need, then, Lord, I want to know how do I become part of the solution to that need? Or am I the solution to that need? So it was more, it was like insight. She had insight to people's situations. And the Lord just used her in that way, and she was able to help. She was right on in the way that she helped. Wasn't too much and wasn't too little. It was right on the money. She's humble. Not only is she, she reflects Jesus in this, these beautiful characteristics, but she's humble. Her story is well known, but yet we only have fragments about this woman. We don't have a full picture of who she was or where she came from. She's not a Deborah. She's not a Hannah who could offer a son unto the Lord or pray for a son. She's not that. She's not an Esther that was um, very, very, you, you know, used of the Lord in an, on a national level. She's not a speaker. She's never given a Bible, uh, Bible study. She doesn't give women's Bible studies in that sense. She's done nothing spectacular. There isn't anything great that she has accomplished or what she has done or anything about her that we know as, as far as that goes. She has no family history. We don't know who her family was or where, where she came from. We know that um, the tribe of Dan settled in Joppa, so maybe she was from that tribe, but we just we don't know. We just know from her name that she was raised in the Greek culture and spoke the language. She has no children of her own, and yet she has many, many spiritual children. Many so loved her that they couldn't do without her. She's not a missionary. She doesn't leave her hometown. She sees that her work of missions is right out her front door. She looks out there, and there she's utilized, right in her own city, right in the place where she lives. She has no husband, and so we see the significance of a single woman having a predominant place in the work of the Lord, that, that um, this is what she was raised up to be, and so, so important that, again, God's stamp of approval, raising her from the dead proves that. She just simply had a heart to serve the Lord with the gifts and talents that she had. She didn't hide them. She wasn't puffed up with pride because she had this great um, ability to sew. She must have been an awesome seamstress. An ability to um, manage money in a godly way. She, she's not hiding these things. She's not hoarding these things. She's not becoming puffed up in these things. She's just giving these things to the Lord, what she had, and saying, Lord, use them. You've given them to me. Now what do you want me to do with them? How can I use them for your glory and honor? She would be considered one of those little people. You know those kind of people? It's like most of us, one of those little people. But you know, that's exactly who God is looking for, those little people. The ones that are maybe in a lot of ways nothing great, just ordinary women that have some kind of a talent, some kind of a, an ability. The, um, the, the biggest ability is just to be a friend. You know the need of being a friend, how great that is today, it's just somebody uh, coming up next to another to befriend them one that has been abandoned or hurting or lonely, and, and give a word for the, from the Lord for that person. Love that person. Be kind to that person. Do kind uh, deeds of kindness. That's what God's looking for. When Pastor Steve and I were invited to um, Washington, D.C. a few months ago, 
at the time, our schedules were extremely busy, him, of course, more than I. But I mean, you know, just speaking engagements that he was um, involved in and just the work here at the ministry and just the demanding schedule. And we were moving at the time and we're trying to get that all organized. And we get this call to go to Washington, D.C. And there's just lots of demands upon his life. And People wanted to see him, and he just kind of came up with this saying that, you know, he just says, well, just, just tell him I don't have time for little people. It's just like it's just like too demanding. You know, it's just like something's got to stop. And so because now we've been invited to Washington, D.C. to be uh, present when Push- President Bush signed the partial birth abortion ban, that, you know, we're, we're big people now. We're, we're like major big people. And so he was just kind of, you know, just to, I guess, re- alleviate stress or tension is just, just tell him I don't have time for little people. That was like his whole thing. So our dear beloved Susie, who is so benevolent and so caring and has such words of wisdom at times, she said, tell him it's a good thing that President Bush has time for little people. (laughs) It's little people that God is looking for. It isn't a great gift. It's not a great talent. It's something of ourselves that we give to the Lord in order to help another. And it isn't just a charity thing. This is helps ministry in its truest form. She is definitely the founder of the helps ministry. There's a spiritual inclination to this whole thing, that the reason that I would help, the reason that I would give of myself or get involved in a situation is not just to relieve somebody's pain or discomfort, but it's more deeper than that. It's for a spiritual implication that, that I would have the opportunity, as God leads us, to strengthen another in the faith or lead someone to the Lord. That's what it's all about. Not only that, but she's yielded. She did what she could with what she had. She did what she could with what she had. She has a sewing needle. Nothing of significance about a sewing needle. But this becomes a lasting memorial. Her story, her life, teaches us what the body of Christ is all about. And the significance of women in the body of Christ The little things, it's like that Tabitha's touch kind of thing, that special touch of love and kindness in a deed, um, in a word, in a hug, in a phone call that strengthens another in their walk, that makes the difference. Have you ever called somebody just out of the blue and you've had a conversation with them and they would say to you, you've made my day today. I just needed somebody to say something of what you just said to me. You just made my day. Then you know. You are becoming like a Dorcas. She yielded what, what she, uh, she did what she could with what she had. This is the yielded value of little things. And I want you to write that down. This is a, a pretty deep thought as I thought about this. I love this concept. The yielded value of little things. We know that God calls little people, ordinary women, women that just want to dedicate their lives to the Lord, just have a heart to serve. And they're going to give whatever it is that they have that God has given them in the first place, and they want to use these things for his glory. And now we see the yielded value of little things. When we yield these little things, what is insignificant maybe to some, whatever it is that we would yield, in, in, in the story, a sewing needle. When we yield these things to God, the result of that is greatness, usefulness, achievement, and unlimited blessings. Now, I want you to write the result. If you take notes, this is just a good little thought. If nothing else that you write down today, the value, the yielded value of little things brings about greatness, usefulness, achievements, and unlimited blessings. That would be the reason why I (laughs) would want to give to the Lord what maybe others think is something little or insignificant. Now, little things are always going to be little, but when they are yielded to God, they become great. They become something of significance. And that way, everybody has a place, everybody has a purpose. God has a work to do through you, even though a sewing needle, I mean, has no significance at all, but look at the lessons that we're learning from this life. Dorcas, who yielded to God her sewing needle, It was so important what she did with that little needle that they had to raise her from the dead because they couldn't do without her. And that was God's stamp of approval that he approved of this ministry of reaching out and caring or giving to him the little things so he can make them great. We are not to despise the small things, the things that seem so insignificant or why bother or 
you know, they're not, it's not going to matter if I would write that note or if I would make that phone call. What difference is that going to make? Or you look at the situation and it's so overwhelming and you're only one person. What difference are you going to make? It's those little things, those, those little thoughts, those words that are just anointed by God's Spirit, that deed that God has led you to do that will make a difference. For, for Dorcas, what made a difference was the whole experience brought revival. Not only that, it opened up the door and ushered in the Gentiles. So we can thank her today that she was yielded to God's work because of us. How many of us are Jews here? Anybody a, a Jewish believer here? No, we're all Gentiles. And it ushered in our time that we would come to know the Lord. A sewing needle has no worth in, in itself. It's just a small, inexpensive piece of metal of can do nothing by itself. It just lays there. It has a sharp point on one end and a hole at the other where you thread the thread through it. It is of no significance. However, in the hand of a talented seamstress, it becomes a valuable, useful tool. Now, I love to sew. I would consider myself, not to boast or anything, but I'm a talented seamstress. I love to sew. I have loved to sew since I was able to sew. I don't know. I'm junior high. I loved sewing. My mother sewed. I love sewing. And I take a needle. I am not afraid to pick up a needle. Some people are so afraid to pick up a needle and thread it. I've seen just, oh, I, I just don't know what to do. I, just give it to me. What do you need? Something hemmed? Do you need something uh, tailored? Do you need curtains made? What is it? It doesn't frighten me at all. I know what a needle can do. Sewing needle, of course. I guess in this culture, we better say a sewing needle. <laughs> Without it, there would be no garment, there would be no ministry, no, me- no needs would be met. Just like our lives. As I think about this, God chooses the foolish things, the simple things, the things that are weak and beggarly, the things that are despised in order to confound the, the wise, in order to do a mighty work through. And he takes our lives that are worthless. They, of themselves, we made a mess of them. Many of us just really made a mess of our lives had no purpose, had no direction. The Lord came into our lives. We dedicated our lives unto him, and he gave us purpose. He filled us. He quickened these mortal bodies, and we became alive unto him, and that we would now yield our instruments and all of our talents and all of our abilities to him, that he would use them for his glory and honor. And we, in the hand of the master craftsman, he takes this needle, you and me, we're like the needle, and God uses us to pierce a hard heart to come, know, to come to know him. He uses us to bind up the brokenhearted. Words that he, can, that, that he can give to us, to another, that would comfort a heart that is hurting. He uses us to mend broken or torn relationships. He uses us as a needle in his hand, and we're just the instrument. What makes the instrument so powerful and so wonderful, it isn't the instrument. We're nothing, but it is Christ in us. It is us yielding to the hand of the master crafter that makes the difference. And he uses us for his glory and honor, and many lives are touched. And the reward of that, blessings unlimited, we understand what satisfaction and fulfillment is all about. When you can reach out, it says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is a blessing to receive. It's not that it isn't, but it's more blessed to give than to receive. But believe me, we know those of us that have stepped out and those of us that are doing, and those of us that are involved in ministry some way, somehow, we know the blessings of it. When a life has been touched, and we have been the instrument of helping someone get on their feet and have victory in the Lord, that's the greatest fulfillment ever. And the Lord teaches us how to handle our children, how to train them, how to, how to mend our marriages. It just goes on and on and on. In fact, she is definitely the founder of the HELPS ministry. It isn't a charitable works or organizations that we're talking about. This is the helps ministry that has the spiritual implication, and this ministry continues in the church today. And it is powerful because you're touching lives that are in need. And of the virtuous woman, it says that she reaches out to the, to the poor and the needy. In order to do that, though, we have to reach out of ourselves. This work was tedious. It was had grueling demands, an exhausting schedule. It required endless patience, unselfish dedication, the denial of self. Her days were spent sewing and washing and cutting material. It is thought that she probably had some kind of a shop where she would sell the um, things that she would make 
and then that money would go back into helping these that were in need. Remaking, fitting, and mending garments for the poor and needy. That was her, that was her task. And what made it so great, the reason that she was so successful and had such a powerful ministry is because she assumed responsibility. That is such a special ministry today, not just giving a gift, but she was personally involved in giving that gift because she was spirit-led by God, and it accomplished something, and it accomplished something for the glory of God. All she did was dedicate what she had. She did what she could with what she had. She dedicated that little sewing needle to God, and he, through that, brought forth a wonderful, powerful ministry, a a very needed ministry, the much-needed ministry of being a friend, just reaching out and touching someone for the Lord. We can all do that. We can all give something of ourselves, plus our talents and our gifts, for the work of God. And so I encourage you tonight, be a Dorcas. Oh, there's a need for that in the church. There'll always be a need for that in your uh, the, in the world, within your home, it's just constant that we would just take what we have that God has given us and we say, Lord, use me for your glory and honor. Ordinary women doing extraordinary things for the glory of God because we've been empowered and we're led of the Lord. Amen? So, amen. Father, we thank you so much. What an encouragement that, Lord, we can, too, have a Dorcas ministry. Lord, we thank you again just for your word and the people that we can learn from. Bless my sisters, Father. Ignite within them, stir up within them just the fact that you want to use them far more than we want to be used. But when we give in to you and we allow you to use our lives, the blessings are unlimited. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.